part uh, mathematics of a supervised learning. So you need three things. You need to have data. You need to have a mathematical description of the data. Second thing, what is the classifier that you are interested in? Is it a logistic classifier? Is it a linear classifier? Is it a linear, a, a, a polynomial, uh, first order polynomial like this? What is it? And then you have to have a, a loss function. So these are the three ingredients of very, very basic fundamental ingredients of a learning process. That's what we want to know. We have to have data. What is the classifier that I'm interested in? And what is the associated loss that I have? So there are, very, there are quite a many loss functions. So again, this is a loss function. It could be a, 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 the support vector machine. It has a hinge loss. So again, so this is, a con uh, this is a classification problem. So my loss is basically a maximization over 0 and this uh, 1 minus inner product. So y times this inner product. So let's see this thing. If let's say that my labels are basically minus 1 and plus 1, this is my true labels. If my predicted label is also minus 1, this product will always be 1. If the, if the actual label was minus 1 and the prediction was also minus 1, this product will be plus 1. If the actual label was plus 1 and the predicted label was also plus 1, that product is again plus 1. So 1 minus 1 will always be 0. So my loss is 0, which means I've got perfect training performance. And if, let's say, I have two label as minus 1, but my predicted label is 1, that is minus 1, so maximum of 2 comma 0, so maximization is 2. So whenever I have perfect training performance, my hinge loss will be zero. That's what we have. So it's a convex function, but it's non-smooth. And I'll show in, uh, in the next slide that why it's non-smooth. Then we have a logistic regression. And logistic regression takes place this form. This is not only convex, but it's a smooth function. Because we are trying to solve this optimization problem. And we are trying to solve this optimization problem using uh, gradient descent, which I'm going to talk about later. So I need to have a convex problem because convex problems have global optimizers. Every local minimizer is a global optimizer. This is a fundamental theorem of convex functions. I want it smooth. If it's not smooth, I can't compute the derivative. Because gradient descent means go into the direction of maximum change. So direction is basically the direction vector. If I can't differentiate, I can't do gradient descent. So I have to assume convexity for all the nice properties and smooth smoothness for, differenti uh, for differentiability. That's what we have here. Then we have this least squares, which all of us know. That's what we used to do. When we said draw the line of best fit, we never solved this optimization problem. But all were, what we were doing was in our all physics lab experiments in class 9, 8, or 10, uh, and even like higher in, in, in our college, we were trying to draw the line of best fit that minimizes the least square error. That's what we are trying to do. So that's basically the standard thing. And then you have another one, which is a classification to 0, 1 loss, which actually takes this form. If this is less than 0, this is a 1. If this is positive, this is always 0. And again, there's convex, but non-smooth. So depending upon the task, there are associated loss functions that you could use. And these are not the only ones. You could come up with your own loss function also. But there are different losses that are assigned to regression and classification. And here's a plot. For this one. So there's a 0, 1 loss, and we can clearly see there's a jump discontinuity. So it's not differentiable at 0. It's a non-smooth. So I have to use algorithms that actually take, uh, cater for non-smooth uh, uh, functions. And again, if I look at the square and, uh, and uh, logistic loss, these are perfectly smooth, and they're differentiable all, uh, uh, everywhere. When I look at the hinge loss, I have a corner here. Again, it's, uh, uh, it's not differentiable at the corner. So you have two non-smooth loss functions, both convex. You have two smooth loss functions, which are both convex. So convexity is always like kind of preferred. You could try non-convexity also, but here we are only talking about convex loss functions and whether they are smooth or unsmooth. We always prefer smooth functions because they're easy to differentiate. So that's what we have here. So, yeah. So for example, when, I talk, when I'm talking about regression, I'll probably use a least squares, for example. For example. This, okay, uh, like you're trying to estimate some parameter. It could be anything. You're trying to estimate, for example, this thing. You're trying to, very, very simple example. You're trying to come up with a model that what is this proportionality constant that actually tells you that force is, is, is equal to, the, uh, is directly proportional to extension. How do you plot this line? You do least, least squares. If I'm talking about binary classification, let's say I'm talking about class classification problem, I'm probably going to use either this SVM or logistic regression. So again, if you see that when, when I'm talking about classification, I have these kind of products that are coming. My outcome, Y, is always uh, multiplying with this inner product. When I'm talking about regression, these are always separated. 
there's always an additivity, whether it's a plus sign or a minus sign, there's always an additivity that is out there. When I'm talking about classification, as I just said here, that if I'm classifying, if both, if my prediction matches Y, this is plus one. If it is matches Y for this one, it's also plus one. So for classification, I can use SVM, I can use logistic regression. And it depends, it depends. There is no, to be honest, there is no uh, uh, like perfect choice that you always select this one. And I'll show you some examples. I, I, I'll show one example. I, I have some demos here, yeah. So no, no, it's, it's, it's our own interpretation. Let me give an example. I don't know, like, although I was, I've been thinking of this example and I was kind of scared whether, I don't know if, because it's been recorded and I don't want somebody on the YouTube to see and they revoke my degree. But let, let me give an example. Let's say in phase retrieval, what do we do? In phase retrieval, what we do is we take inner products with some sampling operator X and we take the magnitude response. And this is my, this is what I want. So I want to estimate X. I know this operator a, AK. I know this measurement V. So what is this thing? This is nothing but the Fourier transform. Its Fourier coefficients are squared. So this is nothing but the magnitude response uh, of these things. This is a nonlinear function of X because there's a square root. Uh, sorry, there's a square that is going on. It's a nonlinear function. So if I actually talk about trying to solve this expression, it's a nonlinear function. But let's see this thing. Now this thing is basically equal to the trace of a k comma x squared, let's say, and this thing becomes but just by using the trace property a k star a k x star x. That's what it becomes. So I can just say that this is my new matrix A and this is my new vector x k. Now it's a perfectly linear problem. I have up, here my unknown was x. Now I'm saying I don't, I can't, it's very difficult to solve this problem. I just use this lifting scheme and now my X has been transformed to this X, capital X, which is basically X uh, conjugate of X. That's what we have here. So it's a high dimensional matrix now. So it's some feature uh, that we have, some kernel function that can actually map your current feature to a high dimensional feature where you actually have linearity. And here I'm linear now. It's a linear problem now. So a non-linear phase retrieval problem has been transformed into a linear phase retrieval problem. Yes, these are, these are mathematical tricks, these are mathematical tricks. So we are assuming that in a very, very high dimensional space, uh, these are points, these high dimensional features become points, and a linear classifier is the best. Uh, you can assume linearity very easily in these things. I think this is the kernel trick in, in machine learning, yeah. So it should not be from a particular class. It should not be, like, it should be rich, it should be diverse. It should not have biased means that, for example, let's say my data set only includes images uh, of uh, cancer patients who are females, and they're only pediatrics. So it's more number of examples does not, does not always mean it is rich. More number of examples does not always mean it is rich. I want my data, I want more examples, but they should be rich also. They should be diverse also. They should be capturing different expressions, different demographics, different contexts so that my model can generalize to unseen data. So if I'm just giving it a data set, which is basically, let's say, from a very, very specified biased class, and I take millions of samples, it's very difficult for that model to, learn, to perf perfectly predict uh, some sample from another distribution. So that's what I mean. It should not come from this, uh, like, it should be diverse, it should be rich. That's what you want. Because, because linearity is always good. If you could attain linearity, that, that's a very simple answer. You could do. You could do. But linearity is always good. Like, another question is, why are we using convex optimization problem? Why are we using, sorry, convexity here? You could use non-convex also. But convexity is always easy to handle. You have guarantees. You know every local minimum is a global minimum. So there are some interesting properties that you can utilize. So likewise, like, we don't know how to do this thing. It's very hard. But linearity, we know how to solve this problem. So that's the thing. So we are always trying to resolve, to, uh, to reformulate our problems into, into uh, forms that we have already seen before. We have the tools to actually address those questions. That's what we want to do. All right. So again, so we have this optimization problem. I have a linear classifier. These are the theta parameters that I want to estimate. I have a perfectly annotated data. Now, this loss, which is basically over the training data set, is called the training cost. So there are the two costs that are associated to it. There's a training cost, which is basically the ensemble average of the cost over, uh, per example. 
I've, I've deleted that. Then I have a testing cost. Now I have a model that is already trained, let's say. And let's say that I had some outcomes which were already annotated, but I never showed it to my model. So I want to know what is the associated loss. So this associated loss will be basically a mean or the underlying distribution where the data is coming from. That's where probability and random variables and statistical inference comes in. There is a training cost and there's a testing cost. What is training cost? What is the associated question? How do I compute this theta head? That's the ultimate question. I want to minimize my training cost. I want to have a very nice uh, uh, training performance without actually chasing it, without overfitting it. But within reasonable, within uh, the domain of, uh, of reason, I want to have a, a minimum training cost. So the question is, how do I compute this theta hat? And in the testing cost, once I have this theta, how do I analyze this theta? Is it a good estimate? Is it a bad estimate? Is it an, is it an underestimator? Is it an overestimator? I don't know. So what are the statistical questions that you can answer to analyze what theta hat you have, uh, you have obtained from this learning? Because what you do, you have obtained, you already have a training data, you know that on that training data, your training cost is minimized. But now you have some novel data, some testing data that is out there, and you want to understand what is the cost of using this model to predict those novel outcomes. And you want to analyze those things. So you have these two questions that you're, you're always interested in answering here. Yeah. It could be already known. It could be something that you empirically computed from the data. So, but we are not going. To, we are not going. We are not going to discuss the details. So, yeah, if if you already know the underlying distribution and you have a very nice analytical form, you can use it. Otherwise, you have to estimate it. But we are assuming that let's.